Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Many of us have had that problem where our car battery is dead and we need a jump start from someone else. I had this problem actually last year at Vandenberg sitting next to a rocket and when the roadside service turned up, people were joking that we were going to jump start the Delta II with it. But that's actually not such a ridiculous idea because many rocket boosters actually require ground service equipment to start up the engine. For example, the F1 engines on the Saturn V used ground uh, pumped hydraulic fluid to open all the valves. But you know, during the Apollo program, they actually had procedures for jump starting the lunar module's ascent engine so that it wouldn't get stuck on the surface of the moon. After all, getting roadside assistance in the middle of a space launch complex is hard. Getting roadside assistance on the surface of the moon is basically impossible. So the reason I discovered this obscure procedure was because of another unrelated question on Twitter about the Lunar Module's Ascent Engine, which somebody pointed out is not lined up exactly with the vertical on the model. And the reason for this is that it is a much simpler engine than the Descent Engine. So the Descent Engine had to be able to you know, deep throttle, it had to gimbal so they could steer it, hover and land exactly where they needed it. The Ascent Engine, it had to get the crew back into space and its job, it just had to work. There had to be no way that this could fail and that meant that they made it a lot simpler engine and uh, they didn't give it gimbal capabilities and it was just lined up at the factory through the center of the mass of the spacecraft and of course they had to figure this out in, ad uh, in advance they had to figure out where the equipment was going to be stored where the samples were going to be where the astronauts were going to stand and of course they also had to figure out where the fuel and the propellant was going to be because, uh, you know, they use aerosene 50 and dinitrogen tetroxide and a 1.6 ratio. And that meant that the fuel, the fuel tanks and the, oh, sorry, the fuel and the oxidizer tanks were largely different sizes because they had different densities, different fuel consumption rates. And actually, I've got the model here. If you've got a model of the lunar module here, you'll notice that on this side here, it's much larger because that's the lower density uh, propellant and that's the higher density propellant. And they're balanced through this engine here. So by accounting for this, the engine could more or less be fixed during the ascent. Any residual rotations would be damped by the reaction control thrusters. But anyway, that's a small aside. The main thing about this engine is that it has to absolutely fire and there's redundancy all the way through the system. For example, the valves that turn the fuel flow and the propellant flow on, instead of having one valve for each, there's four. They are set up with two fuel lines in parallel with two valves on each so that a single valve failure doesn't stop the startup and it doesn't stop the shutdown. But before the engine could fire, the LEM had to also sever all its links to the descent stage. They had to cut the power, the uh, you know, pressure lines, they had to cut structural members and they had explosive guillotines and explosive bolts all the way through this, all controlled by the explosive devices system. And if that explosive devices system failed, there were backup systems to make it work. And after you had exhausted various uh, you know, iterations of problem solving, you would eventually get to the point where you would pull out a special cable called the ED adapter cable. And you could actually hook this in like a jumper cable to pull powers from batteries which weren't intended to originally power that subsystem. So they could try pulling power from one of the batteries on the LM, but if that failed, it was entirely possible for them to uh, suit up, open up the hatch and then step outside with one set of the cables and go looking for a battery. So part of the procedure was they would step out and take a look around and get the lunar roving vehicle. And I know what you're thinking, they would drive this up to the module, but they wouldn't use that to start. I know that would be so cool if they could have started up the LM using the lunar rover, but no, they would actually use this as a platform to climb up onto the modular equipment uh, assembly, basically, where that's the one to the left of the, land, the ladder, where it contains a TV camera, it contains the sample collection equipment and various other gear. So they would climb up that and then they would reach around to their left and there would be a relay box that was connected to batteries. And very carefully, they would use scissors to uh, snip open the Inconel sheets, the foil. And there was lots of warnings in this procedure about making sure you don't accidentally, you know, create things that can cut your gloves or your pressure suit or anything. And I'm going to point out this entire procedure also had to be performed 
after they had performed the preparations for departure. And one of the preparations for departure was they had to throw their portable life support systems out of the, the hatch to save weight. You know, they, they did this in Apollo 11 and they actually caught this on the seismometers, which is a kind of a cool thing. So these would be sitting outside. The spacesuits would still have the capability of taking, uh, you know, fuel, sorry, not fuel, but uh, oxygen and water and power from the lunar module. But if they were going outside, they still had a 30 minute air supply that they could use. Uh, they wouldn't have the regular water cooling system, but it, you know, half an hour they could would have to do all this. That would include possibly a hundred plus meter trek out to the the lunar rover, driving it back, climbing up this system, the the mesa, opening up the batteries, connecting your jumper leads, and then climbing back inside, and then hooking up your leads after you've prepared the module for launch. Now you'll notice at this point they haven't closed the hatch, right? So when the time comes and they launch, they will obviously fire all the explosive devices, sever the module, it will take off, and they will be flying into space with the hatch open, kind of like driving down the highway with your window open for extra ventilation, except this is the reverse. You've got the, you know, cables will be dangling out the bottom. So once they're on their way to space, that's when they have to, you know, complete the ascent, and then they can unhook their uh, the cables, close the hatch and pressurize the module while, of course, flying the spaceship at the same time. So this is one of the craziest procedures that I've, I've heard of, and it is actually the last one in the volume two manual. So like clearly a measure of last resort. I, I'd love to see this in, in a simulation sometime. Uh, and was it uh, Harrison Schmidt actually talked about this in one of his uh, blog postings. So. That's where I realized that this was no longer a joke. Now, some of you are probably wondering, could we actually have used the lunar roving vehicle to power this up? I mean, the battery technology is the same. They both used silver zinc technology, but you know, maybe the cable is long enough and maybe the contacts could be exposed, but I'm not an electrical engineer, but I'd, I'd like to know if somebody could get an answer for that one. Uh, elsewhere, it's not the only case where one spaceship has jump-started another one. On Apollo 13, you've seen the movie, there is this whole problem with the fact that they lost their fuel cells early in the mission and had to shut down the command module, shut down everything to conserve power. And there wasn't enough power in the command module to complete all the startup procedures that they wanted to do for re-entry. Normally during flight, there's a pair of umbilical cords that sit in the docking tunnel that connect the two spacecraft. And usually the command module powers the lunar module. But by closing the right circuits and shutting off the right systems, they figured out a way that power could flow back in the opposite direction and charge the modules and the batteries. So there's, you know, of course, you can read all these procedures in the transcripts, and it's not as simple as flicking a switch. There was a lot of things they had to do to make fl power flow in the opposite direction. On the Russian side, Salyut 7 was their space station, which had a problem that caused the space station to lose all its power and spin out of control. A mission a crew went up to it and they docked with the uncooperative station. They got inside and they figured out the electrical problem. They at one point considered transferring power from the Soyuz batteries directly into the space station, but uh, in the end, they figured out a way to connect the solar panels directly to the batteries and bypass the broken charging circuit. So, you know, that was an eventuality they avoided, but it was one that they had seriously considered. So yes, <laughs> spacecraft they're just like complicated cars and if you've got a buddy around with a working battery sure you can jump start your spaceship i'm scott manley fly safe